primarily was on thy kingdom come this week, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And there is, I believe, in popular culture, we say things, we will use expressions and not really think about what we're saying. And let me give you a quick example. We'll say, and pray my strength in the Lord. But the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So it might be more accurate to say, pray that I have joy in the Lord. Amen. That would be strong. That would be giving you strength, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'm not saying that it's wrong to say, pray my strength in the Lord. I would have said something a long time ago to stop it. Yeah. All I'm trying to say is that there are times when we can get caught up in expressions and not really know what they're saying. Yes, sir. Second? Yeah. Third? Oh, that you've heard, yes. He said, I'm the second person he's heard say that. All right. I uh, should have been first. I, I'm too slow on the draw. No, that's, there, there are many things that we say. And sometimes, even in our songs, there are things that we say, that we sing in our songs that are just wrong, or scripturally is, we don't know what we're saying. There's a song, um, and he said, if I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And then we'll say, help me lift Jesus. Well, when he was saying, if I be lifted up, he was talking about being put on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. So what are we singing? Help me put him back up on the cross. Yeah. Or he's my rock, my sword, my shield. He's my wheel in the middle of a wheel. That wheel in the middle of the wheel was judgment, death and destruction. So you saying, he's my judgment, my death and destruction. That's not what we mean. But we just singing it because it sounds good. And we get all happy about it too. <laughs> so in this scripture, when Jesus said for us when we pray, and we should be talking about Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, thy will be done is something that we say all the time, just loosely. If someone is sick, we say, pray that the Lord's will be done. If somebody wants a job, pray that the Lord's will be done. We just kind of throw that out there. But when he was telling us to pray that his will be done, it's because God has a will. The question is, what is that will? But we'll get to that in a minute. Luke chapter 2, verse number 13 and 14 says this. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now that's what uh, they were saying at the birth of Jesus. Who was saying this? An angel and the heavenly host, right? Angels, seraphims, cherubims. He said, who is the heavenly host? It is all of those angelic beings, yeah. Not every single one of them, but enough to be considered a multitude. Um, glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace. So that's what Jesus was supposed to be doing, right? Isn't that what they're proclaiming? But now if we go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, 51. This is Jesus talking. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. Now, isn't that what they were just saying there in chapter 2? Peace on earth? He said, so do you suppose that I'm coming to bring peace on earth? 
He said, I tell you nay or no, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house, or there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now, when he's saying this, he's not giving a specific formula, but he's telling us how his division will be, the division in the church, or the division that he's bringing. What, it, what kind of division will it cause? It's going to cause family problems. Isn't that who he's talking about here? He's talking about, end times. He's talking about the question is, is he talking about end times? He's talking about his times, current times. The church times is what he's talking about. During the church age, did you think that I came to bring peace? I didn't. Another place he said he came to bring a sword. But he's, he's saying, I didn't come to bring peace, but the father against the son. This is, there is going to be a division between fathers and mothers and their children against husbands and wives, children and children, in-laws. The reason why is because you get married, and you ain't marrying just the woman. You're marrying her family too, aren't you? Amen. You may not like it, but let me let you in on a little secret. When you marry them and have kids, your children is related to both sides. You can get up and walk away and never come back again, and your children are still related to both sides. I let my mother-in-law know that every now and then. My wife does something, I'll say, she's your relative. I'm not related to her. I tell my kids that too, because it's true. She's your relative. She's not mine. She's got her head down, so. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. Amen. We just leave it alone. He said, I did not come to bring peace. Now, who's wrong here? The angels and the heavenly host is declaring peace on earth. Goodwill towards men. How, how can that be reconciled? How can you say one is right and the other is wrong? Who, who was right? Who was, was the angels right or was Jesus right? Who, who was wrong? So Jesus is always right. The angels was wrong. Yes. The angels were wrong. No. Yes, sir. Now, wait. Say that, start that again. I don't think what? Okay, I see what you're saying. He said he doesn't think that God's will is all is always done or always is played out the way he wants because he said it's not his will that any should perish. And you're right. Yes, sir. He said, what about the scripture where he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts? Well, that's true, too. But the angels were right. And Jesus was right. The problem is the time frame. When the angels proclaim that, that is one of the things that Jesus will do, but it just wasn't going to be in his lifetime. If I can say it that way. The 33 years that he lived, it wasn't going to be during that time. I'll take it a step further. It won't be in the church's time either. Yes, sir. Well, 
Okay, you bring up a very good point. He said, for someone that hasn't been saved very long, this can be confusing because what it says and it being at two different times can make it look confusing. That is the reason why the Bible says, read to show thyself approved unto God. It doesn't say that. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God. That is the reason why even, and we can take it even further, when someone has a calling to the ministry. They don't just jump up and run out and start preaching because you can start preaching something, be all off. Don't even know it. I think I taught about that one time in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, 25, somewhere around in there. He says, they, the disciples ask him, when shall be the end of the world? And something else, they ask him, three or four questions and Jesus starts off by saying um, well let's go there so that we can be clear Matthew chapter 20 uh, 24 uh Jesus, starting at verse, verse 3. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Three questions they ask him. Now, he answers all three questions, but one of them he answers in two parts. But I want you to see what he says here. Jesus said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Now, they're not saying they're Jesus. I am Christ. I am anointed. And you hear preachers saying that all the time. God has put a special anointing on me for, they're saying, I am Christ. I am anointed. Isn't that what Christ means? I know some of y'all thought that was a last name, didn't you? It's not. His name was not Jesus Christ. His name was Jesus, the Christ, the anointed. Okay. They shall come and say, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Ye see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation. And kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, that's what we're living in right now. Okay. The very next verse starts off with, then. Every single time you see a then, he changes time periods. And it is not in chronological order. Verse 9, then shall... Verse 10, and then, we change times again. Verse 14, and then, change times again. Verse 16, then let, change times again. Verse 21, for then, change times again. If you read this 24 and 25th chapter of Matthew and think that it's in chronological order, it will have you all mixed up and twisted up. Every then changes times. And you have to be able to start from a then and go to the next then and find what is being talked about in there in the Old Testament to find out what time period he's dealing with. Some of us dealing with the millennial reign. Some is dealing with the tribulation. Some is dealing with the church age. Some was dealing with shortly after the very first century A.D., each one of them has a different time, and you have to be able to go back and study and find out. A lot of preachers have taken that in chronological order and come up with some crazy doctrine. I talked to one one time, and he said, I know you believe. And, and, and this brother was baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, but he got off because of that. He said, um, this can't be. 
what was talking about. He said, and this is that which was talked about by the prophet Joel. And he goes off into something. He said, he, and he said, and then shall, and he said, then, and then shall there be darkness. And he said, the moon ain't turned to blood yet. This ain't the talking about the pouring out the Holy Ghost. I said, man, it's because you got it wrong. Your time is wrong. So you have to, you have to study. You really do. Because if you don't, you're going to miss a whole lot in there. Find yourself kind of drifting off somewhere you shouldn't. Study to show thyself approved to who? Unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Who is it that's studying that they be not ashamed? A workman. Man, let's just, he that desires the office of a bishop, he that desires the office of a pastor, desires a good what? A good work is what he says. So a workman is in the ministry. If you're going to be out ministering and witnessing to people, you need to know your Bible. So when is he talking about on earth peace, goodwill towards men? If Jesus was very specific, did I come to bring peace? He left no doubt in our mind as to what he was talking about at all. Yes, the angels may have came at my birth and declared peace on earth, but did you think that I come to bring peace? No, I didn't. So when are we going to see Peace on earth, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. When will we see that? When the, the Prince of Peace comes, she said. But the Prince of Peace has already come and gone. Millennial reign. After the thousand years when the devil is locked up and after the tribulation. All three of those answers are the same one. Isaiah. <laughs> And they're all right. All three of them are right. You just said it a different way. That's all. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Ain't going to be no wolf tearing up a lamb, chasing him down to, to eat him. The wolf will lay down with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid or the baby sheep. And the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together. All of them going to lay down. You can't see, you won't see that today. You know what? There are people who get lions and try to raise them as pets. This one man did it. He raised him from a little bitty lion, from a cub, little like a kitty cat. He raised him. And he would feed him. He took care of him. And one day he locked himself out of his house and couldn't get in. So he broke the window to unlock the door and cut his hand and got in there. And when that lion smelled that blood, tore him up. You know why? Because that's in his nature. When he smelled blood, he attacked. It didn't matter that that man kept throwing him dead meat. When that lion saw something alive and bleeding, he went back to jungle. And he ate that man up. So we can kind of play around now and try to domesticate wild animals. But they're not really domesticated. They'll get you. you if you catch, them, you catch them wrong, they'll get you. They do that with snakes. This one, one man went on vacation, told his friend to come and feed his python. He had mice. He gave him live mouth. The man forgot. He's supposed to go over every so many days. He forgot. And how many ever days, if it was like every other day, it was a week. And he hadn't been over there, and he just remembered. He said, oh, let me go over there and feed him. And he took that thing, and when he lifted the lid and hung the mouse over the edge, that snake jumped up, got the mouse and his hand. Started wrapping around his arm. He couldn't get that thing off of him. It was a constrictor. 
Now that the fellow that owned him, he had been he had been raising him from a little bitty snake, taking care of it. But the moment that animal got hungry, he went back to nature. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, yes. I remember that in the mood, in the news. She's talking about the woman that raised that monkey, and something happened. I don't know what it was that happened, but he went crazy and ripped her face off. He did. He tore her up. And and monkeys are not big, but they are very strong. Much much stronger. Yes, sir. He said that was a chimpanzee, and it was kind of a large animal. She tried to take him and make him a pet. And I suppose he was okay for a while. He jumped on her friend. Okay, he, she said, he ju- I don't know. She said she, he, did he jumped on her friend and she was trying to get him to stop and he wasn't going to have no part of that. No, he wasn't. You know why? Because he had gone wild at that point. Do you know what they do to animals when they do that? They kill them. You know why? Any idea why they do that? Yeah, if they do it, once they get a taste of wild in them, you're never going to get that back out of them. It's been lying dormant. But once it comes up, you ain't getting that out. That's how come they take claws out of kitty cats. Because once they get, once they get a taste of the Scratching on stuff and sharpening their claws. You ain't stopping them from it. He talks about how during this time, the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox. Uh, I'm sorry, I skipped a part. Let's go back up to verse number six. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. What he's talking about is, right now, it takes an adult that is a trained animal trainer to be able to take these wild animals and be able to work with them. But during this time, a little child will be able to take a lion and a fatling and a calf and a cow. A little kid will be able to take them and lead them around and nothing bad's going to happen. Right now, you let your child get up on a wild animal and a horse or a cow stomp them to death. A pig, you, you get up in there with a pig, a pig will knock you down and eat you up. I don't know about these folks that had these pot belly pigs or whatever they are. All I know is bacon. I can't get with that, having pigs up in the house on the couch. Uh, and I know they're they, they short-haired, and they, give them, they say all kind of stuff about it. Here's the thing. Something wrong with that, having having ham and bacon laying up on my couch and I'm not eating it, Uh -uh. uh-uh. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lions shall eat straw. Lions are not vegetarians. But at this time they will be. They're going to eat straw like an ox and the suckling child shall play on the hole of an asp. An asp is one of the most deadly snakes there is. He'll play on the hole of an asp and not worry about getting bit. And guess who else won't worry about it? The child's parents. Don't have to worry about that. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cocktrice den. I don't have no idea what a cocktrice is. Whatever it is, is bad, or they wouldn't have used it as an example. <laughs> It's some kind of animal or something. That it's a dragon? Okay. Whatever it is, I don't want to fool with it. 
They shall not hurt nor destroy in any or in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now this is during the millennial reign. But did you catch what he said about what's going to happen? That the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. They don't have that right now. You know what people say? If I may borrow this from you, deacon. Well, I haven't been saved long, and so I don't know how to rightly divide all of this. But he said, but now during this time, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. How much knowledge will they have? It'll be like the waters that cover the sea. Everybody will have full knowledge of God and understand everything during the millennial reign. They will. And that during that time, they're going to beat their plowshares into, or, or beat their weapons of war, their swords into plowshares. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. They're going to destroy all their weapons that they're using to kill each other now and turn around and use all of that for agriculture and building. They're going to build houses during that time and then live in their own house. That's what the Bible says. They shall build and live in their house. They shall plant and eat. They shall build and another not live in their house. They shall plant and another not eat. You're going to build your own things. Plant your own food. You don't do that now. You might build a piece of a house or build something on your house. But most of us don't know how to build a whole house. But during this time, everybody's going to, it won't be anymore, I got to go clock in for the man. Not during the millennial reign. You're going to be doing, working for your own self. That's going to be a time when, <laughs> yeah, brother, I'm with you on that. Don't have to clock in. He's he just getting excited thinking about it. Now, how old are you? He's 20. I'm 54. I got a whole lot of years. I should be up here dancing thinking about that. <laughs> whole lot of years of clocking in and out. But during that time, there's going to be peace on earth. There will be goodwill. Nobody's going to be looking at how they can scam somebody else out of something. It's going to be goodwill. Everybody's going to be trying to help each other. You, you, you need your tire fixed? Well, let me help you with that. And then go on about my business. Not sitting around talking about, ooh, I know I'm going to reap what I sowed. We, they won't be doing that. It's going to be goodwill at this time. I ain't looking to get nothing in return. Isn't that what goodwill is? Goodwill is, goodwill is something not looking for anything in return. Yes, a thousand years there'll be goodwill towards men, peace on earth during that time. So when the angels came and they proclaimed peace on earth and on earth peace, goodwill towards men, when they were proclaiming that, why? Because Jesus is going to rule during the millennial reign. It couldn't happen until he was born. He had to be born live, die, have a church, get a wife, then have the millennial reign. So it was the start. The reason why it's confusing to us is because we just jam it all up into one thing. Make it be one short little period of time. But it wasn't. They were proclaiming what was coming. Jesus said, if you think that's why I'm here now, you're mistaken. I come to divide. So... How? How is he going to do that? How is, how is it dividing? Mother and father and all of that. How, how is it that there is this division caused by the church? Well, we don't see no division. It's rare when you see somebody that's in, and I'm just going to throw a couple of things out there, maybe the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses or Buddhists, someone that's Baha'i or a Muslim 
so-called Christians, when you see that, there's really not too much friction. They're not too much trouble. But it's rare for someone to get baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and walk in and say, I'm going to live a holy life and then not cause a problem. You want to cause a problem? Go tell them, I went and joined church today. Oh, well, good for you. I just got baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, it don't take all that. It causes a problem. Immediately, people start getting upset with you. Let your child walk in the house. I've been going to church lately, and I decided that I'm going to get baptized next week in Jesus' name, and, and I, I want to get the Holy Ghost and the first thing family will start doing is, what do you got to do all that for? Why can't you go to the church that you grew up in? That's what they do. Oh, yeah, he brought division. Right in the home. Now, I'm a living witness of that. It created a big problem in our house. When we got the Holy Ghost, it, it started a war. I'm not just saying that it did. Four years, four years trouble. What was that movie, 12 Years a Slave? I felt like four years a slave. <laughs> Boy. It created problems. How can I sit back and be angry at God about that? He said, that's exactly what I've come to do. I've come to, to, to create division because what you have, they don't have. And one thing about people you want to talk about a master psychologist? God, he invented us. He knows how we behave. As soon as I give you something that they don't have, they're going to be upset about it. Just all you have to do is walk into a house that's got three kids and bring one of them a present. What's going to happen? The other two that didn't get the present is going to say, Yay, look, my brother got a present. I'm so happy for you. You sure they're not going to do that? Oh, no. Where's mine? How come I don't have one? I want one, too. That's what kids do. Jesus knew how people would behave. I've been going to church all these years, and you come up talking about you got something new. And then they see that you're different. Oh, no, hold on, wait a minute. Now they mad. That's what people, that, Jesus knew that's how people were going to behave. It creates all kinds of problems. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, uh, go to that church to be saved. Just like there's many roads that lead to Chicago, there's many ways to get to heaven. And yet the Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is above you all and in you all and through you all, saving you all, sanctifying you all, helping you all. Just one. He even narrows it down, straight as the gate, narrows the way that leadeth to life. And few be there at that find it. Only a few folks are going to find it. And yet, everybody saved. Now, I've seen, I've watched preachers on TV, you know, and we went over to uh, Africa, and we were out in the jungles, and uh, 10,000 people were, received Christ. I said, please. No, they didn't. They'll do stuff. How many want to be saved? Start counting. How, how do they know how many? If it was 10,000, how would they know? They take a census? All right, I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> how many what? Yeah, he said, instead of saying how many want to be saved, how many want to live holy? Yeah, that'll put a stop to a whole bunch of stuff. If receiving the Holy Ghost was not different, if it don't take all that, 
then why, is, why do folks fuss about it? Why don't they just say, well, if that's what you want to do, well, I'm happy for you. How come they just don't do that? Why do they immediately start talking about, oh, well, if you go to the book of Romans, chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How come they got to bring that up? Mark 10, 18, and Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. So see, nobody's perfect. You can't say that you say because you're doing all this to be right. Nobody's perfect. Jesus said there is none good. Now I suppose you're going to try to tell me you good now. Oh, they'll come up with all kind of stuff to try and make you feel bad. Paul even said, when I would do good, evil was present. And when he got done, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. And now you're trying to tell me that you saved and all that. See, folks want to try and manipulate you out of what you have. Why? They don't do that to folks that say, you know what? I've just gone over to whoever church gave the preacher my hand and the Lord my heart. They don't bother with you over that. They don't say, where does it say that in the Bible? No. The moment you tell them, I'm, I'm going to start living right, I want to live holy, folks start getting angry with you. So then what is the will of God? I mean, we want to... Jesus said, when you pray, that we should pray, thy will be done. Well, what is his will then? How can you pray for it if you don't even know what it is? Did you know that God had a will? Well, brother, brother Christian, he quoted one of them. It is not my will that any should perish. That is the flip side. So now, what is his will? That everyone be saved. That's his will, isn't it? All right, well then let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse number 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye should abound more and more. And what all he's saying is, we have already instructed you, already taught you how to please God. And it is our desire that you not become stale with that, but that you abound more and more. That you continue to not only do that which pleases God, but even more on top of that. How can I give a practical example of something like that? Well, I know that my wife likes flowers. And she's talked to me and said, it will really please me if you got me flowers on my birthday and flowers on Valentine's Day. And I say, okay. And I do that for the first year. And then the next year I say, you know what? I'm going to step my game up and I'm just going to buy her some flowers this month for no reason at all, just because I love her. Now that's abounding more, isn't it? That's doing above what she said would make me happy. Well, if we are loving God and we want to please him, we don't do just the bare minimums. We want to do more. That's what Paul is saying, that we abound, that he's so ye would abound more and more. You continue on and on to do more and more and more of what pleases God. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now, here it comes. For this is the will of God. So you want to know what his will is, right? We're going to be praying for it. This is the will of God even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. How can you be a fornicator and praying, thy will be done? No? Nothing? I'm, 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 I'm hearing crickets here. <laughs> wow. 
how? How can I be asking God to send somebody over here? Uh, look at the way she's looking at me. Ooh. You know what I used to hear guys say? And, and this was a shame. When I was in college, uh, some of the guys would say, if you want a wild girl, go get one that's in church. They so pent up, uh, they'd do anything. Now, if, if at that moment they died, folks would be talking about, oh, I know he's in heaven right now. How can you, how can you say things? How can you justify saying, I want to do the opposite of what God wants, but I'm going to heaven too? And I'm gonna, I'll show you a little bit further on in here. It's more than just doing something. He said that you abstain or that you hold off from fornication. Now, fornication is just a general term that we use for any sexual immorality. There may be different adultery, bestiality, homosexuality, all of that comes under the umbrella of fornication. So abstain from fornication. I'm saying that because I know we've got lawyers when they want to do wrong. Folks become lawyers. Well, now I really didn't touch him. I just looked close and my arm bumped up against them. So is that really wrong? This fornication stops all of that. Any illegal, any unsanctioned by God, sexual immorality is fornication. That's including your webcam on your computer and what you're doing in front of it late at night for other folks to see. All of that. I have to say it because people, people will say, well, uh, well, she was over in China and I was in Mississippi. That don't make no difference. So the first thing that's a part of the will of God is, is that we abstain from sexual immorality. That everyone should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. What vessel is he talking about? Your bodies, right. Your bodies. That everyone should know how to present themselves when they go out in the street. Sanctified, honorable, separate, apart from the world, right? So part of my prayer should be, Lord, keep me from cheating or from doing what comes to my mind that's sexually immoral. Lord, help me when I leave and walk up out of my house today that I present myself as one of your children, that I know how to talk to people, how to dress, how to dress. Sisters, I'm about to make y'all happy. When I walk out, my underwear ain't showing. Oh, that, that is ridiculous. We're going to go witness to somebody sagging. How are you going to do that? I can't get past looking at your underwear. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> she said that she works sometimes. You work out at office in different people's homes from time to time. She, she'd look outside and see them just walking down the street, snowing with their pants sagging. You've been wondering, how can they do that? Aren't they cold? Yeah, they cold. They silly, too. <laughs> it's just silly as they want to be. But you know who else is silly, too? The ones that's looking at them saying, Boy, you need to pull your pants up. <laughs> oh, quit it. I tell you what, if every single woman, every single girl said, till you pull them up, don't even call me. You know what they'll do? They'll pull them up. 
Now, I'm not trying to lay the responsibility of how men dress on the women. I'm just saying we complain about it, but y'all are date them. Not nobody here. Because the, the saints at Christ Temple know no better than that. No, not here. But other girls, they'll date them. And the whole time fussing, you need to quit doing that. You need to pull your pants up. Before I leave the house, I should be praying, Lord, when I leave up out of here, I want to dress, I want to look, I want to talk in a way that shows honor and respect to you. Now, verse number five, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Now, concupiscence is a, is a compound word. Um, con, it's Latin. Con is with. And cupi, and, I'm, and I, I may be saying these wrong because I, I, I've not, not brushed up on my Latin. Cupi is desire. And then the um, E-S-C-E-R-E, -E, which is the tail end of it, means, and, and put together, it is concupiscence with desire, and the latter part of the word means origin or beginning state or process of something. So it is saying it is where the origin of lust, where the origin of desire comes from. We say that lusting is sin. He's saying get to the root of it. There's something that causes you to lust, and you should get to that. My prayer should not be, Lord, please don't let me see no money laying around on the counter at work today. That shouldn't be it. It should be, Lord, help get the desire to steal out of my heart. You got to get to the root of it. Yeah, I got to stop lusting. Somebody going to leave it laying around. And you might have to pray. Lord, please let me walk past this pile of money and not pick it up. My wife and my mother both worked at the police department in Indianapolis. They weren't policemen, but they worked there. And one of the guys from the armored car service told either my mother or my wife that there was a bag of money, $15,000 or something like that, or $150,000 or something. It was a large sum of money that was in bags that was sitting there and had been there for many years. And they couldn't, for some reason, they didn't know where it was supposed to go, so it was just sitting there. Now, if you've got a thieving heart, it's going to take some work to not go by there and just start off by peeking in the bag. <laughs> After a while, let me just count it and make sure nobody stole nothing. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll work that thing around. I'm going to just, I, it, that way if the boss walks in and catches me, I can tell him, look, bag looked kind of funny. I was counting to make sure it was still all there. And then once you got your full count, well, then one day, what's $50 going to hurt? I'm going to get my gas cut off. I'll put it back as soon as I get my bonus. As soon as my income tax return comes in, I'm going to put that money back. Soon as my check comes in, I'm going to make sure that I put that back. You know what that's called? Embezzling. Yeah. You know what the Bible calls it? Stealing. Now, it don't matter what anybody else calls it. The government, the police, the prosecutor, whoever, they can call it whatever they want. What does God call it? Oh, okay. So I got to pray, Lord. Part of my prayer life then, it is not the will of God that I should be sitting around lusting in concupiscence. That I should be, Lord, 
I know I have a problem with this. Help me today. Help me with this. I'm struggling here, and I don't like the way I feel. I don't like the fact that that's in my heart. Help me. I want to get this out of my heart. That should be part of my prayer. I'm out of time. Let me hurry up here. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Don't matter. You know what? You can call it all you want to. I'm just a good businessman. When you're tricking people, you are defrauding them. Well, they didn't ask me had the odometer been turned back. So I didn't feel like I had to tell them. You knew you were defrauding them. Now, that's federal, I believe, now. You mess with them odometers. But, you know, we'll know that the car don't run right. It shakes and rattles, but only when it's cold. So I put it up for sale in the summer, and I don't say nothing. You know you're defrauding. You're tricking somebody. You know you're not exposing or disclosing everything about it that might change a person's mind. I have sold things to people and told them, well, now it does this, this, and this. And they say, that's okay. And I said, and, and it was tearing me up because I didn't want to tell them because I knew they wasn't going to buy it if I told them. I said, and it does this too. I can't get it to duplicate it, but it does it sometimes. And they said, I don't care. Took it anyway. Do you remember the first van that we had out and we sold it? We put it up for sale out here. It sat up for a long time. Somebody came along and said they wanted to buy it. Soon as they did, the first thing I said was, I started telling them everything that the dealer said was wrong with it. I said, we took it to the dealer, and he said, this rod or whatever it is is coming apart, and he's saying that it can't be fixed. The guy crawled up under there and looked at it. He said, oh, I can fix that. And I said, okay, but I just want you to know. And they also said this, this, and this. He got under and looked at that, too, and he said, I can fix that, too. I said, all right. And we sold him the van. I didn't have to come back up in here worrying. Three months later, is he going to be coming back? You know why? Because we didn't try to defraud anybody. I told him everything that was wrong. I had made up my mind. I'd rather put it in the dump than to sell it under false pretenses, than to sell it and not tell everything. If nobody bought it, I had already told Deacon Harris, if they don't buy it, if this guy don't buy it, just haul it to the dump. I had already told him. I was like, I'm not... It's, it's not in great condition anyway. If somebody wants to use it, I said, the engine is good. I said, if nobody wants to have it, take it to the dump. So we don't defraud people in any matter because that, why? The Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testify, don't be tricking nobody because God will get you. You don't have to tell people that. God knows how to do his job without you telling somebody. Amen. Verse 7, for God have not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And I really should deal with that some more, so maybe next week we'll pick up here. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. You are not hating a person when you hate somebody. He said, you don't hate them, you hate me. So you can get upset with somebody, tell them they ain't saved, and I can treat you any kind of way because you ain't living right no way. You can do that if you want to. He said, but you ain't hating them, you hating me. Do you think Peter... Peter had the keys to the kingdom, didn't he? The apostle Paul had to come and set him straight because he had, he had started going back into his old ways. He said, I had to withstand him to his face. Peter was getting off. Paul had to get him right. What if Paul would have said, mm -hmm, see, look at him. He's supposed to be having the keys to the kingdom. What keys? He ain't got nothing but skeleton keys. He could have dogged him if he wanted to. But he didn't. He went, got him straight with the scriptures, and settled the matter. Be careful what you say about God's people. Amen. I know a man, not personally, but he was upset with God's people and called them rebels. 
and he didn't get to go into the promised land because of it. So be careful what you, how you badmouth God's folks. No matter, they was wrong. They was cutting up. They was threatening to kill him. But God didn't take too kindly to him badmouthing them like that. Amen. All right. I mean, it's in the scripture for a reason. God punished him. That wasn't the only thing he did. But one of the things that he did was he name called God's people and they wasn't even living right. Be careful who you name call. Them. Be careful who you're talking about. If I can be just real plain, be careful who you're talking trash about. Because you might be, he said, you're talking about them, but you ain't talking about them. You're talking about me. All right, next week, uncleanness and cleanness. Because we got to be clean, but if you don't know what being unclean is, then you can't be holy. He said, he didn't call you to uncleanness, but unto holiness. So the opposite of being holy is being unclean. Right? All right. Any questions? Anything? All right, stand on your feet.